Well, it's good to see you guys. Uh, we're so thankful for those joining us online, those that are here this morning. And uh, if it is your first Sunday with us, as Kyle already mentioned, we are uh, especially thankful that you're here today. Um, and you picked a great Sunday to join us uh, because we have been walking through the book of Romans uh, for quite a while now. Uh, we actually started back in August of 2020. Uh, so for several months, uh, we've been walking through Romans. But today's a special day because we're about at the halfway point. We're, uh, we finished the first seven chapters. Uh, we're going to be starting Romans chapter 8 uh, next uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks, which arguably one of the uh, greatest chapters in, in all of Scripture. Um, but the Romans is one of the clearest pictures uh, of the gospel, clearest definitions and understanding of the gospel uh, in all of the Bible. And so uh, it's just been powerful for us to walk through this. And so today uh, we're going to review a little bit. Today's test day. Try not to look so excited, okay? Um, I know, test is probably not the best comparison because, like, who likes a test, right? But, uh, but there's, a, there's a sense in which every day is a test, honestly. Um, it's a test of what you believe, a test of your faith, uh, a test of your character. Uh, and so the reason I wanted to stop before we go further and really kind of set up chapter 8 is we've covered a lot, uh, for starters. Uh, and secondly, I really want you to take it to heart. I, wanna, uh, I want you to know and understand what the Bible teaches us about the gospel, what it teaches us about salvation. Uh, it is so important that we have a right understanding of that, and not just for your own sake, um, but we've made a commitment this year as a, as a faith family that um, we are committed to, to praying for one person by name that we feel God has laid on our heart to, uh, to invest in, to pour into, to share the gospel with, to share the hope that we have. Uh, and so it's one thing for you to know and understand it yourself, but you need to have a good grasp and understanding of it, especially if you're going to share it with others. And so, so that's another reason why this is so important. Um, and so, uh, so we wanted to pause before we got further uh, and jumped into eight. We really want to take some time and, and uh, review a little bit. Uh, and so, so the, uh, there's a, I want to quickly show you why this is so important. Um, and, and sometimes we can, we can mishear things. You know, sometimes we can think we understand something, but we don't. Um, or, uh, you know, you ever, you ever reacted to something uh, or responded to a question and that's not even what the person asked you and you didn't know that till about halfway through your response, right? That's always embarrassing. Um, and so, so sometimes we just mishear things. And that's funny when it's everyday conversation, but when it's something that affects your salvation and your understanding of God, that is so important that we hear and understand this correctly. And so, you know, speaking of like mishearing things, uh, I wanted to use an illustration this morning. I know in the past, uh, I've done this before, uh, the old misheard lyrics, but they are so much fun, aren't they? Um, I mean, it's so much fun to joke and laugh about how, you know, Jefferson Starship taught us that we built this city on sausage rolls. Instead of rock and roll, because some people apparently sing that. Um, or it's funny to think about, you know, how Credence Clearwater Revival taught us that there's a bathroom on the right instead of a bad moon on the rise. Now, now you got that in your head. Next time you hear it, wait for it. You'll sing it. Um, or one recently that I heard that, that was kind of a new one for me, because I've shared some of those with you before. But this one I thought was interesting, um, that Eddie Money apparently taught us that he's got two chickens to paralyze. And you thought that was two tickets to paradise, but somebody somewhere is singing at the top of their lungs, two chickens to paralyze. I don't know. I don't know how this happens. Um, but instead of, since I've done that whole thing before, I thought I would share it a different way about how we mishear things. Um, I had this, I had this friend in high school, uh, and we, man, we laughed so hard at her because she would misquote common phrases all the time. And so it was hilarious. So she'd be like, look at us and go, man, when your parents find out, the roof is going to hit the fan. <laughs> and we're like, I'm not sure that's how that goes. You know, and she'd say, you better watch it. You're skating on hot ice. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not even possible. Uh, you know, and then, then she would say, you know, listen, I'm just telling you, you've made your cake. Now you're going to have to eat it. I mean, now you're going to have to lie in it. You know, she would like, and I'm thinking, well, that's just messy, first of all, and I don't even know what that's supposed to mean, right? Um, or she would say, well, you know what they always say, you know, we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you could burn a bridge and you could cross a bridge, but you probably don't want to burn the bridge when you come to it. That's just dangerous for everybody, right? Nobody wins in that one. 
Um, and then one of my personal favorites, she'd be say, she, she would say, don't bring me into it. Listen, you're barking up the wrong creek. <laughs> I'm like, is that with or without a paddle? I'm just curious because, wow. And so, so speaking of mishearing things, I just thought, you know, it'd be fun to just see, here's some others that maybe you've been guilty of saying yourself, I don't know, uh, but here's some fun ones where you can mishear things or think you, you're saying the right phrase. Here's a few. Um, so correct me if you're wrong, which is not how that phrase goes, by the way. Um, a blessing in the skies, right? It's just a, a blessing in the skies. Thank you. Um, we'll just play it by year. Wow, that's going to take a while. Um, cry like there's always tomorrow. There's always time to cry. You can do that tomorrow too. All right. I'll see it when I believe it. Now, you know what's funny about that one? That's actually a good idea for like when it comes to faith and what we're talking about. Um, and so that's kind of neat, but that's not how the phrase goes. Um, and this, another favorite one, go hard and go home. (laughs) Hey, you're going to lose anyway, but just go hard and then go home. Then take the walk of shame right? Um, You made your bed, now eat it. So this is the other one of you made your cake, now lie in it. So this is the other version of that. You made your bed, now eat it. Um, It's like water over the bridge. Not sure how that works. Um, Lightning strikes when the iron is hot. Now there's some words to live by, my friend. Not sure what's happening. Not the sharpest tool on the block. That's how I feel right now. Um, give, Give them a taste of your own medication. I don't think that's how that goes. There's more than one way to bring a cat because everybody needs another cat. Um, And then another one, it's just, it's all water under the fridge. Uh, Beauty is in the eye of the tiger. That's not what survivors sang about, but okay. Um, An apple a day doesn't fall far from the tree. Uh, And then these next two, this sounds like my mom, like growing up. Open your eyes and listen. Don't look at me with that tone of voice. Right? Right? And then lastly, don't quit your daydream because, you know, let's all live in a dreamland where we don't quit our daydream. So there you go. So you can mishear things, right? You can misunderstand things. And the reason it's so important, the reason we wanted to take time and review is because people do that with faith all the time. Now think about it. I mean, maybe you've heard somebody say this or maybe you might have been guilty of saying this, but somebody will just be talking and you're like, it's like the good book says, God helps those who help themselves. That's not what the Bible says, actually. In fact, the whole heart of the gospel is you can't help yourself. You're helpless. That's the whole point, right? Or, you know, or somebody will say, um, you know, uh, the God will never give you more than you can handle. Have you read the Bible? <laughs> like, seriously? You will never get to a place where you're not dependent on him. Like, absolutely, God, you will walk through more than you can handle. That's why you need God. Uh, and so, you know, well-intentioned people will say things like this, and, uh, and these things aren't true. Or worse, even worse, when they're asked about salvation or how they know that they're a Christian, like, oh, well, you know, I live a good life. I, uh, I go to church. I read my Bible. That's not salvation. Listen, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. You know, and, and, and reading the Bible, and, and I'll, let me say this first before I go any further. The church is by God's design. It's God-given. It's a good thing. We need biblical community. We need each other. But just attending something doesn't make you a Christian, doesn't make you a believer, doesn't make you a Christ follower. And in the same way, people will say, you know, uh, I read my Bible. Okay, um, the Bible is powerful. It is given to us. It's the word of God. It's living and active. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We need God's word. However, reading the Bible doesn't make you a Christian any more than reading a math book makes you an engineer, right? It's salvation is found by grace through faith in Christ alone. And that's what we've been talking about for the past few weeks. And we've got to get this right. We've got to have a right understanding of what it means, where salvation comes from, what it means to be saved, and, and to be able to communicate that. And so, so this is a really, really hard task this morning. But hang on, because we're going to try to summarize chapters 1 through 7. And I'm going to do it using four words this morning. Four words. Um, and those words are sin, uh, justification, grace, and sanctification. So sin, justification, grace, 
and sanctification. Now, there's a lot of, obviously, there's a lot of words that are covered in chapters one through seven. I'm just picking four to try to get the heart and the foundation of salvation uh, and so, and, and have us understand that. So, uh, so <clears throat> my hope is that as, uh, my hope this morning that, is that we would think about God, about sin, about Christ, and about life the way the Apostle Paul does, the way God does. That's our desire this morning. And so we see a summary um, of, of really not only the gospel, but the, the heart of Romans. We see this in Romans chapter 1 um, in two verses, verses 16 through 17. Uh, and it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so Paul lays this foundation of, of the gospel and, and how, what he's going to talk about and what that means. It's the righteousness that's been revealed by God. Uh, but then he's going to talk. He, he goes right into our first word, and that's sin. And so as we talk about sin this morning, I know you're like, why don't you use that first, right? Do we really? I mean, we tend to minimize sin. And the reason we're starting with sin is because that's where Paul starts. Um, he wants us to understand just how bad our condition is before we can really understand the good news of the gospel. And, uh, and so he starts with sin. And uh, sin is not, not so much bad action uh, as it is a condition, like, like oftentimes we think of, of sin in terms of bad actions like lying, stealing, uh, etc. But Paul says it's much worse. It's a condition of our heart. We have a sinful nature. We are born into sin. And, and what's so important about understanding this is because even the view of sin is often debated. Like, oh, is sin really? I mean, we just kind of make some bad choices or we've had it. But but what the Bible teaches us and what we understand, if you're ever going to understand salvation, you've got to first understand your need for it. You've got to understand how deep our sin is. We are far more sinful than we believe we are or that we admit we are. Um, and, and so Paul is, the, the fundamental problem is, is that all of us have sin. Not just, you know, it, it's not, uh, you, your role is not to be better than someone else. Like we, that's how we think about life. We think, well, I try to live a good life. Well, how do you define a good life? Well, as long as I'm not doing what they're doing or living better, but your standard is not each other. Your standard is a holy, perfect, sovereign God. And Paul wants us to understand that, that all of us or in the same condition, it doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter how old, how young, doesn't matter poor, rich, doesn't matter what your background is, all have sinned. We see this in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Uh, he says it this way, for all have sinned, not some, not a few, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So no matter, no matter how good you think you are, you can't be good enough because the standard is God, it's perfection. And you fall painfully short. So you got to start there. you got to start with a, a right understanding of our sin. Um, and, and not only that, not only are, have all sinned and not only do all fall short, um, but that is what brings about God's righteous judgment. And, and we don't like to talk about this, right? We don't like to talk about the, the judgment or the wrath of God, but it's very real because God is holy, because God is just um, that he judges our sin. We are under condemnation because God created us to live in relationship with him apart from sin. But when we chose sin, we were separated from God because God is holy. He can't, uh, he, he can't be in sin's presence. And so the reality for us is to, to understand that we've been separated from him and, and because of that, we stand in condemnation. We stand under God's righteous judgment toward sin because he's holy. In fact, Paul shows us this um, right after the verse, verse, opening verses we just read uh, in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, Paul says this, um, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Um, and so, so we see the standard right away. Um, in fact, uh, Romans, two, Romans chapter 2, verse 24 says it this way. 
Uh, it just it goes on to say, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And so this sin, the, the sin is, here's another way to think about that. Sin is sin first, not just because it hurts other people. It's sin because it first, uh, it first blasphemes God, first and foremost, uh, to understand that. And uh, it's an affront to a holy, righteous God. Uh, John Piper talks about this in, in preaching on this passage or on Romans uh, 2. And here's what he says. He says the, it's the ultimate, talking about sin and blasphemy against God, he says it's the ultimate evil and the ultimate outrage in the universe. And he goes on to say it this way. This is all because of sin, because of our state. The glory of God is not honored. The holiness of God is not revered. The greatness of God is not admired. The power of God is not praised. The truth of God is not sought. The wisdom of God is not esteemed. The beauty of God is not treasured. The goodness of God is not savored. The faithfulness of God is not trusted. The promises of God are not relied upon. The commandments of God are not obeyed. The justice of God is not regarded. The wrath of God is not feared. The grace of God is not cherished. The presence of God is not pursued. And the person of God is not loved. That's our condition. That's our state. No matter how good we want to think, we are born into sin. Um, The infinite, all-glorious creator, by whom and for whom all things exist, is disregarded, disbelieved, disobeyed, and dishonored by everybody in the world, including you and me. And so... God is marginal in human life. This is our our sinful condition. Um, And the consequence of this is the wrath of God. And so uh, what we just read in Romans chapter 1, 18. So unless we get this clear in our heads and real in our hearts, powerful in our emotions, the love of God will will be reduced to a sentimentalism or reduced to God's assistance for our self-help. Unless we understand our fallen state, we have to start there. Um, and so, so if that's the problem, what's our hope? You guys are like, man, I'm so glad I came today. This is so encouraging. You got to start with how bad we are. You got to start there, right? And once we understand that, then you begin to understand why the gospel is good news. Because uh, our hope, that's our problem. What's our hope? Our hope is found in the next word. So we talked about sin. We talked about our state. The next word is justification. And so while all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. And because of that, we deserve death. We deserve separation from God. But the gospel, it doesn't just reveal the, the righteousness of God. It reveals a righteousness from God. Now, here's what I mean by that. So, so when you look at the gospel, when you look at God's standard, God's standard is holy, right? It's that, and, and so because he's holy, because he's just, um, we are under condemnation. That reveals his righteousness. That reveals just how true he is. It reveals just how right he is, just how just he is, right? But it not only reveals righteousness of God, how just and right he is, it also reveals, the gospel also reveals the righteousness of from God. Uh, And we see this in uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. And it's going to include the verse we read a minute ago. Um, But listen to this all together. Um, Chapter 3, starting at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. So it's been revealed. It's been shown to us, not only the righteousness of God, but now from God. It's revealed apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For again, there's no distinction. We read this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then verse 24, here's our word. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. Now there's a mouthful, but we talked about what that means. That means that he was our substitute. He took our place. Um, That God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. 
This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just. So that's the righteousness of God and the justifier. That's the righteousness from God of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so here's what we define justification as. Justification uh, is an act by which God declares sinners righteous based on the righteousness of Christ. Justification is an act by which God declares sinners righteous on the, based on the righteousness of Christ. We get that through faith. That salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. That's the gospel. And that's the picture of justification. And so God is saying you can have righteous, you can have a right standing with God, but it's not going to come from the law. It's not going to come from your ability to live up to it. It's not going to come from you being good. This is why salvation is not about us living a good life. That's not where it comes from. You're not righteous because you've lived good. By God's standard, no one's good. And so you're righteous because of your faith in the righteous life that Jesus has lived on your behalf. And through that faith in Christ, he became on the cross your substitute. He took your place. He took the penalty that we deserved. He took the death that we deserved. And through his death and through, by his resurrection and our faith in him, we have new life. We are redeemed. We are rescued. This is the gospel. This is why it's good news. Um, And it's not based on how well we've done. It's not based on our good life. It's based on what he has done. It's outside of us. And so it's not just a righteousness displayed. It's a righteousness given. Uh, and so we talked about, uh, so, so how does Jesus solve our problem? You know, I already, I kind of jumped ahead, already said this, but, um, that we've got all this sin, all this, we're in debt to a holy God and all, and it demands the penalty of death, uh, and condemnation. And so God being just, he punishes, he punishes Jesus in our place. All the wrath and condemnation that was to come on us comes on Jesus. Uh, and so, uh, God, uh, we, we understand it's not that I am righteous, so God rewards me. It's that while I am still sinful, God has rescued me because of my faith in Jesus. And so we not only see the justice of God in the cross, but we see the love of God. And that's what we see in Romans 5, 8. Uh, it says it this way. But God shows his love for us in this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because you got your act together, right? Not because you were living great. Not because God said, oh, wow, you're doing such a good job. I'm going to rescue you. While we were sinners, while we were in rebellion, he demonstrated his love by dying for us, by redeeming us, by rescuing us through his death. Um, And so, so this is the picture of justification Um, that not only do we see God's justice, right, because uh, our our sin deserved a penalty, it deserved condemnation, but we also see his love because not only did Jesus take our place, but he chose to take our place. We see the love of God, the grace of God, and we're going to get into that. Actually, I'm still jumping ahead. Um, But his perfect record has been given to us. Um, That was another word we looked at, imputed righteousness, which means it was given to us. It was added to our account. Um, And so it's more, so what Jesus accomplished for us is more than forgiveness. Justification is more than forgiveness. And the reason I want you to understand that is because, again, we want to get this right. It's not just, hey, uh, I'm living a good life. No, that's not it. Jesus lived the good life I couldn't live. Well, hey, I'm forgiven. Actually, it's deeper than that. You're not just forgiven. And this is why justification is more than forgiveness because forgiveness says, um, forgiveness says you may go. You've been released from your penalty. Like your penalty has been paid. You may, you may be released from your penalty. But then it's up to you. You've been forgiven, but it's up for you to live a righteous life. 
But this is why justification is deeper than forgiveness. Because it doesn't just say, go, your, your, your penalty's been forgiven. It says, I want you to stay. You're welcome to all my love and all my presence. That's what justification is. You have a right standing, not based on your behavior, but based on what I have done for you. That's the power of the gospel. That's the picture of, uh, and, and justification is a legal term. It happens the moment that we put our faith and our trust in Jesus. We are given a right standing before God, not based on our behavior. Um, and so it, happen, it happens in a moment. However, uh, there's a danger in thinking that our faith is what's doing the work. Um, because, the, you know, sometimes we can think of this, well, because we are saved through faith, right? We can, we can somehow think we're saved by faith, but we're actually saved by grace, and so it's important to remember, it's not that the amount of faith or how you know, much faith you've shown that you get salvation as a reward. That's not the gospel. Um, in fact, to understand there's a danger in thinking that our faith has done the work. It's not our faith. It's the object of our faith that is our salvation. Uh, we use this example. It's been months ago. Some of you might not even remember this. But if I put feathers all over my arms, right, and, and had faith that I could fly, right? I really believe, I sincerely had faith. It wouldn't matter how strong my faith was, that was gonna not end well for me, right? When I went to jump off of something. Um, the opposite is also true. I could get on an airplane with no faith that I could fly or very little faith that I was gonna get where I'm going, right? Or that I'm gonna be able to fly. But the difference is, and then still arrive there, the difference is not the amount of faith I have, but the object of my faith. In the same way that Jesus is, the, uh, Jesus is our salvation, faith is just the instrument by which we receive it. And so we need to have a right understanding of that, that, that Jesus is, is doing the saving work here. Uh, and, and so it's important for us to, to have a right understanding of this. And, the, and then ultimately, this brings us to our last word, our next to last word, grace. And this is, this is by grace, that God sent Jesus to die for me, and he did so I could have a relationship with him, so I could have life in him. Well, that is a powerful thing, but there's a motivation behind that, and that's Paul tells us about this grace of God all throughout um, chapters four through six. And so I just want to go through, we're going through several verses, but this is, these are verses we've already read um, but I just want to show you how grace comes up again and again and again. Um, and so starting in Romans chapter 4, verses uh, 7 through 8, uh, Paul says this, uh, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and those whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not count, who, blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Uh, and then in Romans 5, 1, we read this, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans 5, 10 through 11. Uh, I'm going to read it up here. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is all grace. He's showing us the grace. Verses five, uh, chapter 5, verses 20 through 21. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that in, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so what we see time and time again throughout here is not, uh, is the unmerited favor of God. That we didn't, he didn't give us this because we earned it or because our faith was so strong or because we did the right things or because we were good. He, we didn't, we didn't deserve it. Um, and maybe you've heard grace defined that way, unmerited favor. But I recently heard a, a Bible teacher take it a little bit further and he used a different word and I kind of understand his point. Um, he said, rather than unmerited favor, it's actually demerited favor. Because unmerited favor makes it sound like, hey, I didn't go the extra mile. I didn't do enough. And so God you know, grants us salvation. That's grace. But it's actually demerited favor. It's not that we didn't go the extra mile. We went the opposite mile. 
It's not that we didn't do enough. We were actually rebels in our sin. And yet, God, in his grace, made a way for our relationship to be made right with him. Uh, and so, so we see all this took place through Jesus, through the cross. Um, and, and so, uh, but then there's a danger in that. Um, because even when we understand grace as demerited favor, then we, have a, we can have a wrong understanding of grace. Well, if salvation is, is by grace, then it really doesn't matter how I live, right? I mean, Paul was expecting this argument. Like, okay, so God did all the work. It's not based on me, so I can just live and do whatever I want. And Paul said, no, you're, you're not understanding salvation because it's not just that you've been uh, justified. It's not, it's not only that you've been uh, you have a right standing with God by grace. You've been given a new life in him. You have a new identity. You have a new heart. You have a new nature. And that's life in the spirit, in the Holy Spirit. And so that's when we get to our last word, and that's sanctification. And so while justification, if you can follow me, justification rescues us from our standard, from, from God's condemnation. Okay, so we're rescued from condemnation. We have a right standing, a legal term. Again, not because of what we've done, because of what Christ has done. That happens the moment we put faith in him. But that is not a process of transformation. That is a legal declaration. So we are justified because of Christ through faith, by grace through faith. But we're not changed. We're not made new through that justification. We're just made right with God. The process of transformation is called sanctification. And so, so when, uh, when people say, oh, we can just live however you want, that's where Paul says, you have a new nature, a new heart, a new motivation in Christ. Jesus is not only the solution to our condemnation, he's the solution to our contamination, right? That we are under Christ, that, that we have been born under sin. Jesus is the solution for that. Um, not only has he given us a right standing, but he leads us to live a right life through the power of the Spirit in us. Uh, and so, so we begin to understand Romans 7 shows us this journey, this, this process of sanctification. That um, it, it shows us who we were and who we now are in Christ. Uh, and and so, so, you know, when you think about who you were and who you are now, you know, some questions come up like, is a Christian a saint or a sinner? Uh, is, is a... Uh, is a Christian a saint or a sinner? Are we, um, do we have a new nature or a sin nature? And the answer is yes, in that order. Uh, in fact, um, you, you, we are redeemed sinners. Uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, he had a phrase, used a Latin phrase to describe this. And you're just going to know that I'm pronouncing it correctly because you don't know how to say it, although you can correct me afterwards. Um, but the phrase was uh, simul estus et peccator. Uh, and it basically means that we are at the same time righteous and sinners. That while we have a new nature in Christ, we still have an old remaining fallen nature, an old sinful nature. Um, and, and that's what we talked about last week, that, that all of life we are being sanctified. We're in a process of becoming more like Christ, that he's conforming us into the image of his son, that we are battling with our sin. Um, and we know we have ultimate victory in Christ, but there's still a fight. There's still a battle. Uh, and Paul is showing us that while we've been given a new nature in Christ, he's given us the power to live according to his word by his spirit. There's still an old nature hanging around. Um, and, and so that doesn't mean... It, it, it means that there's a fight against sin that, will, that we will carry all the way till we spend eternity with Jesus. But what Paul wants to show us is that now in him, um, that we've, we've got to hold these tensions in, in rea- this tension in reality. Um, you know why? Because it gives us both humility and confidence. In other words, if I believe I'm only a sinner and, and not a saint, then I'll live a defeated life of self-pity and despair and I'll never experience the joy or the abundant life that Jesus promised me in him. However, if I believe that I'm only a saint and not a sinner, then I'll become prideful and self-righteous. 
and, and miss and, and not understand my desperate dependence on Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit alive in me. And so a right understanding of the gospel gives you both humility and confidence. Humility because you understand the depth of your sin and the depth of your need for Jesus. Confidence because you understand that your salvation is not based on what you do, but what Christ has done and what he continues to do in you as he makes you new, as you trust and follow him, as you submit to his lordship, as you seek him. And, and so this is the tension that we see. Um, and that these both, while both realities are true, we must see that now fundamentally what defines us is the life that we've been given in Christ. That's the true us, the real us. There is still an old, uh, an old sinful nature, but what defines us is our identity in Christ. In fact, that's what Paul's been saying all throughout uh, chapters 1 through 7. And I'm just going to show you this really quickly. These aren't coming on the screen, so just bear with me. Some of you might be frustrated. I can get it to you later. But, uh, but here's what he said. We were unrighteous, but now in Christ we are righteous. Chapters 1 through 4. We were enemies of God, but now we're friends of God. Chapter 5, 1 through 11. We were fallen in Adam, but now we are raised in Christ. 5, 12 through 21. We were spiritually dead, and now we're spiritually alive. 6, 1 through 14. We were slaves to sin, and now we're free from sin, from the power of sin. Uh, 6, 15 through 25. We were, uh, we were under law, but now we are under grace. 7, 1 through 13. We were in the flesh, but now we're in the spirit. 7, 14 through 25. And this is what Paul shows us. This is how he turns the corner. When he, so, so we've talked about sin. We've talked about justification. We've talked about grace. And we've talked about sanctification. And here's what Paul shows us. We have a new identity. As we get prepared for chapter 8, this is what he says. Chapter 7, verse 6, um, and it says this. But now we are released from the law, having died of that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not the old way of the written code, which brings us to the glorious declaration that we have in Christ. And that is Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore, because of all of this, because of salvation is by grace, through faith, not through your works, everything through what Christ has done, by your trust in him, because you are seen righteous before God and made righteous through the power of Christ in you, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. That's the promise of the gospel. That's the hope of the gospel. That's what we want to understand and not just know in our minds, but live in our hearts so that we can not only walk with humility and confidence, but be able to share others where their hope is found. It's not about living a good life. It's not about going to church, although we are called to do that and we grow tremendously with one another. Um, and we're called to read our Bible, but that's not salvation. Going to church, reading the Bible, being good, none of those is salvation. Salvation comes through what Christ has done on the cross and through the power of his resurrection and your faith in, the, in his finished work. That's the foundation that we need. That's what we need to understand. While I remain fallen as long as I live, my fundamental identity is, is as a redeemed, new-hearted child of God. That's where my hope comes from. Not in what I can accomplish, not in what I can do, but in what he has done for me. Uh, and so, um, so while all of this is true, as the band comes uh, to lead us, here's what I want you to understand, that, that all of this is by faith. And, and faith is simply uh, the, us coming, the attitude of coming with open hands, realizing that we don't bring anything to God's saving work. Like it's not about how good we are. It's not what we bring to the table. It's about how good God is and what he's done for us. Um, and so the challenge for us this morning is, do you see? Do you see what it costs God to love you? And are you transformed by that? Are you made new by that? Do you have new life, new hope, new dependency, new identity? 
in Christ. That's the gospel. And so um, we want to just pray for that this morning, that reality, that truth, that we would walk in it. Let's pray together. Father, we start by acknowledging that you, you are the only good thing, truly good thing in the universe. God, you are sovereign, you are faithful, you are holy, you are righteous, you are almighty. And we fall painfully short of your glory. God, in your mercy and in your grace, in your great love for us, you sent your son. And Jesus, we thank you for doing what we could never do, for living the life that we couldn't live, for taking our place, not just, not just dying for us, but dying instead of us, taking the condemnation that we deserved upon yourself and giving us new life, a righteous record that comes from what you've done and a right standing and then, through our faith in you, giving us your spirit, the Holy Spirit, to come alive in us and to give us the very power by which we can live according to the life we've been called to live. And so it is, there's nothing we bring. There's no accomplishments. There's no uh, hope that we bring in and of ourselves. We just come with empty hands. And our prayer and our hope is that we would be found in your hands that you would be our Lord, that you would be our Savior, and that we would walk in that and experience the humility and the confidence that only comes from trusting you as our Savior. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy and powerful name. Amen.